When most people think about leaving their money in their bank account, they often consider this to be the safest place for it. I mean, if they keep it in their wallet or their purse, they might just spend it all. If they give it to someone else to look after for them, they'll probably end up worrying about it. If it's in investments, it's potentially at risk and honestly, guys, other than drug dealers, who really leaves all their cash under their mattress these days? So, in a bank account, it's safe, right? I mean, it's not a risk, is it? It's out of harm's way and you're less likely to spend it all. But in that case, what leads to scenes like this taking place? Where bank clients are literally queuing all the way down the street just to withdraw their own cash. These situations have become a lot more common than we would like to believe and it's when absolute panic sets in. This is called a bank run and it takes place when a lot of clients have major concerns about the bank and suddenly want to withdraw all of their money all at once. But why is a bank run so troublesome? And if we understand what causes it, is it something that we can avoid? Well, now we'll take one step closer to understanding that. In this series on money and monetary systems, we've been aiming to understand what really makes the financial world tick. We've been looking at what money really is and what its purpose is, then we looked at the main types of monetary systems. Those previous lessons, if you haven't already seen them, are all linked down below in a playlist. So go and check those ones out. In this video, we'll be looking at the main system used around the world today, the fractional reserve banking system. In this video, we'll discover what the fractional reserve banking system is, which really might surprise you, how it affects the world around us, and what the benefits or flaws of this system are. If you don't know about this topic already, Prepare to be shocked. When we look at fractional reserve banking, there are different ways to really explain what takes place. On one hand, you have the purely theoretical version, which is taught in universities and is often the explanation that's expected to be recited in economics exams. In fact, this is even the way that a lot of the top economists, including some of those working at central banks, truly believe the system works. However, that's not necessarily the case. The way the banking system actually works is based on the fractional reserve system, but it's actually a lot messier and also a lot more concerning than the picture that you end up understanding from the theoretical approach. Having said that, it is a good place to start as it's the most simple way to cover it. So in this video, we'll start off with the theoretical, or let's say academic version of fractional reserve banking. And that way it's easier to understand and you'll be able to also relate to the people who only understand that approach. But as we progress in this series and start to look deeper at institutions like the US Federal Reserve, we'll be able to go deeper on what actually takes place. This is just step one. So let's get started. Okay, in basic terms, Fractional reserve banking is a system which allows banks to only really need to hold a percentage of their client deposits in their bank reserves. With the rest of that money, they're then free to issue loans or make investments. And generally speaking, this percentage of the deposits that they hold is typically considered to be a minimum required reserve amount of 10%. Although in reality, this differs quite a bit, despite it being assumed to be 10% still, but that's something we'll discuss in a later video as I mentioned at the start. We'll keep things basic and theoretical in this video. So what this means is that a bank can take someone's deposit, let's call that 100%, and they keep 10% of this deposit in their reserves, and they're then free to lend or invest the remaining 90%. All the while, their client still has 100% of their deposit with the bank and assumes that this is accessible. Now the best way to explain this is to go through a basic example. Essentially, this example is going to be explaining something which we call the money multiplier. Imagine you go and deposit £100 cash at your local bank HSBC. So HSBC are going to hold that for you under the expectation that when you need to spend it, you can. Now let's say there's a minimum required reserve of 10%. That means HSBC needs to hold at least £10 of your money in reserves and can loan the rest of the money out. So they take £90 of your money and lend it out to someone else. Now let's assume that next person spends the 90 pounds on a new bed and the bed shop that receives that money deposits it at their bank, which is Barclays. So Barclays receives 90 pounds cash and has to keep hold of 10% in their reserves. That means they hold on to nine pounds and then they're free to lend out the remaining 81 pounds to someone else. 
That person then takes the money and spends it on some car repairs. The mechanic then takes the £81 and deposits it with Santander. Now let's look back at that situation so far. So essentially, you are holding £100 at HSBC, that's your deposit. Someone else is holding £90 at Barclays and someone else is holding £81 at Santander. And you all have a claim on your respective amounts of money. So an initial deposit of £100 by you has now become a total amount of deposits of £271 at this current point in time, which people are likely to want to claim and spend at some point in time in the future. Essentially, the banking system has created new deposits. They've expanded the money supply. This is something we'll get into in a separate video in this series as we are going to be looking specifically at the topic of money supply. However, for this video, there is a basic equation that we can use to figure out the total amount of deposits that are created from this money multiplier effect. It's essentially the deposit divided by the reserve requirement. So in the case of this example, the initial deposit of cash was £100 and the reserve requirement was 10%. So 100 pounds divided by 0.1 gives us 1,000 pounds being created. This is by no means an airtight calculation and there are some obvious flaws as well as many factors being excluded from this. But we wanna keep things basic so you can understand the concept to make it easier to follow along what I'm saying. And this is the basic equation that's used to calculate the money multiplier effect. So essentially, we now understand that there's 1,000 pounds in deposits which clients may want to withdraw and spend but only £100 of cash that's originally been deposited in the first place. The banks base their activity on the understanding that only a fraction of people will require their deposits at any point in time. So if someone requires their money, it can be taken from the bank's reserves and be fulfilled quite easily. But just looking at this from a logical point of view, it's very clear to see where there's potential flaws in this approach and this overall system. Like what happens when suddenly more people than expected want to withdraw their money from the bank or move it elsewhere? This goes back to the images I showed you at the start of the video. When there's an issue in the banking system or with a specific bank and people begin thinking that maybe a bank might become insolvent, which is when a company or individual no longer has the assets to fulfill its financial obligations, then if this is the case, we may experience a run on the bank, otherwise known as a bank run. Like I said earlier, this happens when a large number of clients want to withdraw their money from the bank at the same time. The actual act of a bank run itself can also cause a snowball effect, when more people start seeing the situation developing and start having their own concerns. Now obviously, when this happens, at some point the bank will begin to run out of money and they may in fact face bankruptcy. There were many cases of this happening in recent years, especially during the financial crisis, with banks such as Northern Rock, which was the first British bank to suffer a bank run in 150 years. But one of the most concerning cases was that of RBS, which was at one point the biggest bank in the world. So one day in 2008, the chairman had to phone the Chancellor of the Exchequer and tell him they were experiencing a run on the bank and they'd run out of cash as early as that same afternoon. This eventually led the government to having to intervene to avoid the panic that this would have caused. And it proves that perhaps this system was more fragile than the banks anticipated. Now, remember in the last video, we spoke about the hierarchy of money. If you look on the screen now, you can see the actual hierarchy I showed you in that video with some financial instruments already filled in on it. So we can see that there are certain levels of what's considered to be money or credit. Now, if we consider in a fiat money system, which I explained in the last video, we don't actually have any sort of commodity as the basis of anything. So instead in that monetary system, the highest form of money is that which is held with the central bank, or we might call it base money. From that, once new deposits start being created, this is called broad money and it's not as high in the hierarchy and therefore it's not as secure as base money. So let's have a look at this diagram which was published by the Bank of England and is used to explain the money creation process. This is what we'll be discussing in the very next video in this series as we start to look more into money supply and the actual creation of money. In that video, I'll start to explain who actually holds an asset or a liability in each of the situations and how we can understand the data that's released on a monthly basis on what the current money supply actually is. 
This is how you can then link back everything we're learning to your trading or investing or just general analysis of an economy. Until then, if you found this video useful and you're enjoying this series, then please leave a thumbs up and perhaps even leave a comment below letting us know which part has been the most useful or insightful for you. And if you want more videos about the financial markets, trading, investing and economics, don't forget to hit that little red button down below and subscribe to the channel. Thanks as always for watching, take care and I'll see you soon.